Once again, we meet to discuss research methods. What we'll be doing today is looking at literature review, the part two of it. Part one looked into how to find literature. Part two is going to tell us how to be able to write. So we are going to learn that um, after you have determined your topic and uh, selected your available and relevant literature, you need to critically review the literature to write out relevant sections of your paper or your thesis. This session seeks to explain how to write and uh, review your literature. So how do you review it? How do you write it out? This is what we are going to discuss in this particular session. And thank you very much for participating in what we have been doing for the past uh, three sessions. Our session outline is broken into analyzing and writing review, restructuring the review, and what a good and a bad review looks like. Now I'll be asking some questions this time around, so I want you to pay attention. Now, we are looking at chapter three, and we're going to look into literature review again. And that chapter is quite long in the book, so try and take your time to read it as you watch the videos. We have three things we are going to do today. Analyzing literature review is the first one. So analyzing and reviewing the literature would start by asking ourselves what goes into that. Now, the first time that we met, we talked about what literature review is. And we said it's a synthesis of available resources and materials which have a strong relation with the topic in question, accompanied by a description and critical evaluation and comparative analysis of each work. What we are going to do today is to look at the second part of the definition the description, critical evaluation, and comparative analysis of each work. Now, a literature review plays a key role for the structure of a long essay. For example, some universities have a, a generic structure that looks like this, an abstract, an introduction, literature review, context of study, research methodology, results and discussion, and then conclusion. Now, the chapters that have been highlighted here, chapter one, two, and five, play a very key role in your long essay. All of these chapters require a lot of literature to be able to substantiate your arguments. Chapter one will need some literature to be able to show what gaps exist in the literature to point out what you need to do. Chapter two needs some literature to be able to dis discuss and explain the conceptual underpinnings of your topic area. So we are talking about corruption and uh, in Africa. This is where you explain what corruption is, the different types of corruption, the forms of uh, mitigating corruption in Africa, or the forms in which corruption exists in Africa. Then in the results and discussion, you are going to compare what you said in chapter two with what you have found in chapter three and be able to come up with a conclusion. So you need some literature here too in chapter five. So these areas play a very key role in your long essay. So please understand that every aspect of your long essay will require some literature that you need to be able to review, to be able to write it out. Good. Now, one thing I want to differentiate in writing is the fact that there are different ways in which we express ourselves in every literature write-up. We can write in a descriptive way or we can write in an analytical way. A descriptive writing usually summarizes what other people have found without saying what these findings mean for our investigation or our research. So we can just go on and just say that research on corruption in Africa has been done from different perspectives. This and this did it in South Africa where they found that the, that the church plays a key role in in research, in combating corruption, or this and this did it in um, Ghana and found out that um, proper policies or efficient policies or monitoring of monitoring and evaluation can be able to curb corruption in the construction industry. Now, what I've done here is just summarize what is out there. It can be a chronological list or it can just be an overview of different, different, different papers. But it doesn't actually tell you what it means and relate to your work. When you start doing that, then you are moving beyond descriptive to what analytics or analytical writing. Remember the definition of literary review says that it should be accompanied by a description and no stop at description and a critical evaluation and comparative analysis of each work. Hence every good literary review should move beyond description to go into more analytical writing. Now what is analytical writing? Analytical writing means that there is a synthesis of the work and it passes judgment on the relative merits of the work means that you, after finding what has been there by description, you should pass judgment and find out whether it relates with other works or how does it connect or relate with your own work. For example, look at this. There seems to be a general agreement on X 
and in the reference you have seen c white 1987 brown 1980 black 1978 and green 1975 now what you are trying to see here is that this person who is writing this has read white brown black and green's work and has been able to put them together in a succinct manner to be able to point out that there's a general agreement on x that these authors are agreeing on issue x that's what he's trying to emphasize here now he was able to do that because he has been able to read these papers and point out what is the commonality among them what is the common theme among them hence there is a comparative analysis then he goes on to say however green 1975 sees x as a consequence of y while black puts x and y as something while green's work has some limitations in that it's its main value lies in now what is he doing what he's doing is that he's doing both comparative analysis and critical evaluation of the works he has found and that is where it takes your work beyond description to what analytical work now analytical writing means that you should be able to pass judgment on the work by either relating it to your own work or relating it to other works do you understand what i'm trying to say now if you keep your work if the, you keep the writings that you're reading that this guy has said this and this guy has said that and this guy has said that and this guy discovered that what it does is just doing descriptive we ask ourselves that and so what what is the relevance of all this you are just saying we just don't want summaries of what is out there we want you to be able to look at the summaries and make a, a link analytical links between one summary to with another summary that makes it analytical writing and that is what we are going to learn how to do today okay so in the first thing in the, the main the stages of analyzing literature are two evaluating the source and analyzing the source that's how you are able to analyze the literature and write so we'll learn about analysis of the literature first and after we learn about writing the first thing there are two things in the analysis of the literature evaluating the source and then analyzing the source so evaluating the source we are going to ask ourselves that we have found some articles on EBSCO host or emerald we're going to ask ourselves that does this article tell us anything relevant to my research paper or to the work i'm doing now what do we mean by that do you realize that we, the definition of literature review said something it said that literature review is a synthesis of available resources and material with a strong relation with the topic in question it means that anything we find on emerald anything that we find on EBSCOs have to have a relationship with the topic in question is that not true good now if you are saying that is true that means that anything that we find you any article you have to evaluate the source is it relevant for my research work or for the paper i'm working on number two what do we mean by is it relevant who wrote this now it means that you have to ask out who is the author behind it sometimes an article can be written by a professor who has done extensive research in that area or an article can be also written by somebody who is just a journalist just giving you a viewpoint so you have to be very careful who is writing the article they are picking up from the internet or from the a database then why did they write it mm -hmm. Why did they write it? What is the underpinnings of why they, why they wrote it? Do they have something particular interest or angle they would like to present in the data? For example, you are doing a study and then you realize that you want some statistics on mobile penetration. Then you go and pick that from a Vodafone report. Now Vodafone is reporting it. So if Vodafone is claiming that their mobile penetration is something like that. However, if you move from Vodafone and you go to an institution like NCA, that is the National Communication Authority of Ghana, now that is the regulator of the industry. So you say NCA reports, but Vodafone, you say uh, Vodafone claims. Now, what are you trying to say? You are trying to distance yourself from what Vodafone is because you don't know whether any objective work has been done on what has been is being claimed you are more concerned about what is a report because those report what is a report from nca because nca is a regulator is the objective body behind it so we move from vodafone claims to more, more of nca reports because mca is more of the objective regulator in the particular industry you are writing about so who why did they write it now becomes an issue 
otherwise some, because sometimes somebody can write and have an angle at writing they just want to project a particular perspective or viewpoint how did they get their data how did they come to their conclusion that's another issue when did they do the work is it up to date what else do you know does it support or contradict other sources of evidence comparing them now the f- one point i want to emphasize is it up to date when you are doing your long essay we always encourage that to establish very good arguments try to keep your work within the last seven years so that you can get, have contemporary perspectives on the issue now it doesn't mean that if something is beyond seven years from the year you are in here you're doing the research it's not relevant it's relevant but don't make it that much in your work the higher percentage of work should be in the more of the contemporary works that have been down in the area so that you can keep your arguments current the reason is that if you are picking arguments based on something which is about 10 years old it's likely that if any gap or any um arguments were put across this somebody could have addressed in the last 10 years so if you keep within the seven years at least you have the likelihood of it being totally addressed may not be as much as something that was done about 40 years ago now if i'm going beyond 10 years or even beyond seven years sometimes i will go beyond that to be able to establish or find a conceptual understanding about an issue for example if i'm trying to understand demand and supply curve or um, uh, um one of the economic discussions of adam smith i have to go and find some of his seminar works and read or some of the articles that were published that far in the 60s to read but if i'm looking for je- je- a review on that th- on that same topic i'll look for something which is more contemporary so if you are just looking for an, uh, the very first article or some of the arguments that were put across a particular theory that were, or a particular concept that was existed in 1980 it's relevant that you read that particular f- seminar work the very first time they did it or the right time that was done in 1980. however if i'm looking for arguments of now or now moving beyond 1980 i'm trying to look for arguments concerning the issue i'm trying to research on and i want something which is current and now i want something which is within the last seven years so relevance is very very important otherwise somebody would have addressed the re- issue with the last seven years the last 10 years and you, there's no re- originality left for you to contribute good now another thing that we also try to point out is that whenever you are doing your write-up you also want you to make sure that you're not picking the view from only one perspective you are triangulating from different sources so if you realize when we read on Abbott's work the other time that we met we talked about the fact that he was doing a literature a write-up on corporate governance and defense financing decisions and he talked about developed and developing countries he just didn't look at only developed papers papers from developed countries or developed economies he looked at both from developed economies and developing economies which is very relevant so he's able to do a comparative analysis so to be able to do a very good comparative analysis you should try and get papers from different sources either from academic comparing with um practitioner or periodicals or using periodicals to substantiate other arguments or different sources or different perspectives or different geographic uh regions using and comparing the, the, the perspectives of the issues that you are trying to study. Okay. And different evidence types and perspectives in order to get a balanced view. Overall, evaluation will give you a sense of, of how valuable or not the particular source is. So that comparison is very, very important. That comparison is very important. Okay. Now let's look at an example. Social networking, this is about social networking in the, in the workplace. Social networking is increasingly becoming a phenomenon in the social and business lifestyle of, of employees. Statistics from the 2011 Forbes report on social networking and business stated that 85% of workers in America spend a minimum of 30 minutes of working hours to visit social networking websites. Very excellent. You see how it is written. The first one was an argument, and then the next one, which is statistics from the 2011 Forbes report, is an a statistic coming from a Forbes magazine, a periodical, using being used to support or substantiate this first argument. So these statistics are not too far from that of Africans. As a recent study of South Africa, in South Africa, also found that 70% of South African workers interviewed browse Facebook during working hours. Now, what has it done? It has compared two different um, uh, two different statistics to be able to substantiate one point. It's telling you that this social networking usage in the workplace 
in the lifestyles of employees is not an issue just in the US, it's also in that in South Africa. So by the time you first read it, finish reading the first paragraph, it has been able to establish that social networking is an issue that, that is increasingly becoming um, uh, um, um, part of the lifestyles of employees in the workplace. Secondly, it is an issue that has been experienced or observed in the US and also observed in Africa. So this topic that you are trying to describe is something global. It's not something just, just about Africa or just about the US or just about America. So that is what the first paragraph have done. To be able to do that, you see one academic work here and then one Forbes report here. So we are bringing different sources together to substantiate an argument that was put across in the first sentence. Different sources together, Forbes here and Nugu, which is also an academic work, substantiation this one. Then he continues to say that, then again, beyond the concern on the growth in the use of social networking platforms in the workplace, there have been concerns about implications it has on both employers and employees. Another argument. There have been concerns about it in terms of its implication on employers and employees. While some employers have reported to requesting access passwords to employee accounts, others are exploring policies and strategies to leverage social media in marketing and sales. So one is employers asking the passwords of employees. Another is the use of social media in the strategic use of social media in marketing and sales. Two different concerns being put together. And these two concerns be put together. One is from Jackson 2012. One is from BBC. Another is from Carmen. Another is from California Times. You can see a mixture of periodicals and academic works being put together. And do all of them coming together to be able to put out this particular statement which is uh, the concern there are two key issues here the fact that social networking has become a concern for both employers and employees and another thing is the fact that it's also increased increasing in the lifestyles of employees do you see that and each of them has taken a paragraph so how did the author come up with this the first thing in analyzing a, a source is you should ask yourself that apart from all the questions that i told you to ask you should ask yourself that whenever you are looking at a source and you're reviewing it are you looking for spe some specific item or data for example in looking at the Forbes one we're looking for data on 85 percent of america spend a minimum of 30 minutes that's what we look for here we're looking at the nugus paper we're looking for 70 percent of south african workers so are you looking for a statistic that's one question you could ask yourself or is there any conceptual model or or concerns or points and um, key points that can be drawn from the literature or is there any particular method that has been used that can you can be able to draw from the literature so there could be so many things this particular example that we are trying to examine here is just look look at statistics and then concerns so issues and then some statistics to support the key issues that are there okay so analyzing the source look at it increasing phenomenon was the argument statistic here Another one to the argument to put here, then another set of issue, um, another set of evidence to support the, the particular argument. So you see, this one, one concern, concern two, supporting this one. This one, uh, this one is about statistics, increasing cons, increasingly becoming a phenomenon. So there's a statistic here, and there's a statistic here too. So you see that it's very, very evident in what you're analyzing the source. Analyze the source to look for a statistic or a key issue to be able to put across in your argument. So this is what we see here. The first one is, as an example, you have to select one sub common theme and, and divide it into, into sub topics that represent paragraph chunks. Like this paragraph was more about the concerns on social media. So we broke into two. One concern was on social media privacy. Another one was strategic use of social media in marketing and sales. So there's one concern and concern two, concern one, concern two. When we put them together, we have concerns about social media in the workplace. You see what is happening here? Concern one, concern two. Put them together. Concerns about implication has on no employers and employees. So one sub theme which can be broken into two, or an argument that can be broken into two. And that can represent each a paragraph or a sentence. Now, for each of the chunk, create a topic sentence. What sentence is here? Well, some employers are reported to requesting access passwords to employees. This one too. Others are exploring policies and strategies to leverage social media in the working place. 
those are the sentences for each of the topics one was about social media in the work um, one about social media and, and passwords and another about social media and its strategic use in in marketing and sales we have created our sentences so that one those sentences describe what is in literature then after that we put them together to compare them and the things that made the comparison comparison is this one there have been concerns about the implication it has on both employers and employees so now we, when we put them together we now become well others so these two sentences now support this sentence do you realize it these two sentences now support this sentence so if it was not that case what you would have been having is that you would have having a challenge because this one will be one sentence on disjointed on its own this will also be another sentence on its own but when we put the two sentences together and give it a cover note or an envelope it then puts everything into context so this enveloping sentence covers both sentences here okay then when you are put the sentences together then you have to put the evidence jackson california carmen and bbc as what supporting uh, supporting evidence to the arguments or the illustrations you have put there look at it this one sentence came this sentence came. now we are putting what references here to be able to show that these things are not just coming from our minds there are things that are happening and we are putting them there without them we say says who who said that where is it while there have been some concerns where is it from california times hmm? the other one from Cameron and from bbc and the other one's from jackson do you realize it okay so what you realize here is that literature review is not just a summary of what arguments but it's more about or a summary of just available resources it's more about argument evidence and illustration look at it an argument is here evidence is here and illustrations are there are here while some and others are these are illustrations of this one do you realize it these two sentences are illustrations of this one so in doing a good literature review you need an, an argument you need an illustration and also need evidence evidence comes from this one these references are there so as nobody would just say that where did you take it from do you realize it so argument evidence illustration makes literature review if any any time i'm reading any student's work I look for arguments and I look for illustrations of the arguments and I look for evidence. Illustrations helps to understand the argument better. It helps to give more understanding to the argument. Because the argument is just a summary, but the illustration will break it down and give it different instances. You see, the other one was pointing out that uh, there's mobile uh, social media is increasing in the workplace then give an example from the u.s and an example from south africa so by the time you finish reading the illustrations you realize that the issue is not just about the u.s it's a global issue you realize it good so literature review is about argument evidence and what illustration argument evidence illustration so now that we have been able to know how to analyze this so the next thing is that how do we structure a review how do we put it together to do a write-up Okay, now I'm going to topic two, structuring the review. Any write-up that you put together always has three parts. An introduction, an opening sentence. If it's a whole paper, it may be an opening paragraph. Then it has a body where the literature is put together. And then it has a conclusion, a takeaway for somebody. What is the key thing you are trying to put across? But it's not always that you get the conclusion. The conclusion can actually be another paragraph that leads into another paragraph. So the first two things are the most important in every type of literature review you are doing. So whenever I look at your literature review, not as a chapter, but as a section, small section you are putting literature together, I'm looking for an opening sentence for the arguments, and I'm looking at the body that comes to substantiate the argument. Okay. Now, there are different ways of structuring a review. You can read that use chronological, whether you look at time, because you have done all the literature. So you can look at it, papers that were published on the topic on 1990. 19 in 2000 and in the 2000s and early 2000 and the late 2000s maybe three so in the 90s 2001 to 2005 and maybe 2006 to 2010 and then 2011 to 2015 so that could be one way you could do it 
to chronology. Then you can also look at it in terms of themes. Remember what we said earlier when we look at corruption in Africa. We saw one theme on church in Africa. We saw another theme on Islam Africa and corruption. And we also saw church Africa and corruption. We saw something on um, financial crime, Africa and corruption. And then there was another one too on oil, corruption and Africa. So about five themes or uh, four themes there. So you have a number of themes that could be done. Then you can also look at it in terms of methodology. Papers that use the quantitative approach or papers that use the qualitative approach. Or papers that are done at the na national level, that's the macro level. Or papers that are done at the meso level, that's the industry level or firm level. Or papers that are done at the micro level, that's at the individual level. So sometimes you have papers that are done at different level. Remember we said level of analysis gap. We talked about that earlier. Okay. So let's look at the chronological perspective. Now chronology means that the writer wants to write to be able to show a clear change in the issue over time. The thing that he's trying to study, the topic he's trying to study, he wants to show you that there will be a change in the issue over time. And this is a style of writing. So let's look at the example here. Let's just demonstrate that the key factors which contribute to unemployment in Africa have tended to change over time. Have tended to change over time. In the late 1990s, researchers argued that inflation and low wages contributed, contributed to unemployment. Uche, 2000 and Benson 2003. Now all these are just examples of what he is trying to say, talk about papers in 1990. Now the chronological one means that the writer wants to show that the issue that he's trying to study have tended to change over time. How has the issue changed over time? Now let's look at this example. Richard demonstrated that the key factors which contribute to unemployment in Africa have tended to change over time. In the late 1990s, researchers argued that inflation and low wages contributed to unemployment. Uche 2000 and Benson 2003. Now, he has pointed this one out. So he's going to do an illustration. So he said that, for example, a study by Uche 2000 on unemployment in banking industry in Nigeria highlighted that inflation affected turnover of banks, which also had an effect in salary payments. Over 2,000 banks lost their jobs by the end of 1999. What are we trying to say? Now, all this, for example, is an illustration of what has been pointed out in the first instance. The first instance, he said that in the late 1990s, researchers argued that inflation and low wages contributed to unemployment. So, he mentioned that Uche 2000. So, Uche 2000 is an, uh, to be able to illustrate it, he illustrated Uche 2000's paper. That is what you see here. And he pointed out that this is what happened in Nigeria. Now, one thing that you have seen here is that there is a paper here, there's a paper here. But why is that Uche's own is illustrated, but Benson's own is not illustrated? Uche's one is the one he read. And that's a highly relevant paper. I mentioned that earlier. So Benson's own is likely to be a paper that also supports the same issue, but he, did, he, he or she didn't read it entirely. So he's just using to show that Benson and Uche agree on that issue. So you're seeing comparative analysis taking place. And in, to illustrate what issue it is, he illustrated by Uche's paper. So you see that literature reviews are about argument, evidence, evidence as this an illustration. But this is just a write up. There's an opening sentence, there is an argument that which con communicates the argument. Now he's illustrating. The whole thing, too, is a, a whole big review. So then from there, he said, on the other hand, by 2004, we moved the 90s into the 2004, because he's writing chronologically, so we have to look at the time. Researchers discussed that the lack of capital for start-up initiatives and, and high interest rates on loans stalled entrepreneurial ventures and contributed to unemployment or the lack of job opportunities. Taku 2005, a comparative study, that's, which was done by Kinson, on the SME industry in Ghana and Uganda shared similar findings, similar to what, similar to Taku's own, on the effects of startup capital and interest loans on entrepreneurship and unemployment. So what he has done here is to show, talk about the fact that Casey and Taku have done studies that show that lack of capital for startup initiatives and interest rates, which are high, affect entrepreneurial ventures, which lead to unemployment. Do you realize it? That's what he has pointed out. And these were the issues that were coming up in 2004. Then it goes on, goes on to say, in a recent study on unemployment in Egypt, Salia 2011 found political instability, 
uh, poor governance and lack of foreign direct investment to be critical factors influencing unemployment. Other studies in Cote d'Ivoire and Sierra Leone attest to these findings. Now, he's talking about the fact that political stabil instability, poor governance, and lack of foreign direct investment have influenced and led to um, unemployment in a particular country, being Egypt. Now, any country which has also gone through political instability and poor governance is likely to have the same. So he points out that studies on Cote d'Ivoire and Sierra Leone, which you just need to go to literature and just find out which other studies have also found out the same. So these two studies, Johnson, like 2009, Penn, 2010, he may have not read the whole thing. He just realized in the abstract that these studies were about political instability and how it affects unemployment in this country and that was enough the ones that he read was the one on salia and he has pointed it out there but what does it happen here you have three types of categorizations of time you have those which was in the late 90s those in the early 2000s and those in the current 2000s that's that between in the recent times now what it has been able to do is to look at the factors that influence unemployment in each of the three blocks so he says that in effect, unemployment in Africa may be viewed from a multifaceted perspective. It cannot be reduced to a single factor. And this is true. You can see it from, he has illustrated that to get to point out this argument. Whenever somebody is writing chronologically, his objective is to be able to lead to a particular point. He demonstrated that issue has changed over time. That particular fact, point I want to put across is the fact that what I'm trying to study has changed over time or has the views on, on the perspectives have changed over time, and this is what the views are. So it, it, that, this one, did it through 1990s, early 2000, and the recent 2000, and that's what you can see in here. Do you realize it? Good. So this is a chronological way of writing. Now there's another way of writing which is not chronological. Chronological is very good if you want to put some points across. The other way of writing which is not chronological is called thematic writing, where you look at the themes like in the corruption and Africa study, we could talk about oil and corruption in Africa, church corruption in Africa, Islam corruption in Africa, and then financial crime corruption in Africa. See, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. These are themes. Let's look at the next example. Somebody's writing on unemployment and poverty. And then what are the themes that can come up? What is the structure of unemployment? So what is unemployment, causes of unemployment? What is the structure of poverty? What causes poverty? What is the link between poverty and unemployment? And mitigating poverty and um, the unemployed. So what you can then do is to look for literature or categorize the literature based on these themes. So each folder will have a set of papers in them. And you can use that to write. Now this is a very structured way which is following the themes. So you can structure your literature review based on themes. It means that your, your papers have been downloaded and arranged in your folders based on themes, not based on time. If I, this is a better approach of writing. Even within this, you could actually arrange the discussion of what is unemployment according to time to show that the definition for unemployment in the 90s is different from the definition for unemployment in the 2000s, if only it exists. So even in writing thematically, within the themes, you can also write what? Chronologically. And even in writing chronologically, within the chronological times, you can also write thematically. So you can combine two. Let's see another now. This is about mobile impact of mobiles and micro trading. So there are two themes, two topics here, mobiles and micro trading. So the first one is what is trading? Then the next one is stages of trading. Then the benefits of using mobile phone in trade and the impact of mobile phones on trade. That's all. So these are also different categories. Somebody can also add one, challenges of using mobile phones and trade. You realize it. So that could be themes. And if for each of the themes, you go into the literature to find something that can help him write that section thematically. Okay. Then you can also write methodologically. Methodologically means that you are writing according to geographic regions. Prof. Abel's paper that we looked at in the two sessions ago, what we realized is that he was writing about mob, uh, capital structure and then what? Corporate governance. Capital structure or firms financing decisions and then corporate governance. And he realized that the papers have been published 
that have been published on new themes have been focused on what developed economies at the expense of developing economies so what you're doing is compare one geographic region against another geographic region and that's what one thing can do develop against developed or countries against other countries or rural against urban it all depends on what you are finding in the literature another thing that another thing that others try to do is that they compare the different types of method of collection of data the, while some studies have been using quantitative methods, other studies have been using qualitative methods. And you summarize each of them and compare them against each other. But what is more often done is the develop against developing. Another person can also look at it from the unit of analysis, micro, meso, macro, and meta. Like I mentioned earlier, you could actually look at child trafficking, where you look at the its impact on victims which is at the individual level the role of the church which is more at the meso level the role of national policy which is more at the what, macro level or you can also compare policies in nigeria again uh, with policies in ghana or policies by the ECOWAS states i hope you understand me. and that is more of what a global a cross, cross country or cross national perspective it's all about what you want to write the style is up to you. You could either use thematically and add chronologically, or chronologically and bring thematically. That's what I always advise students to do. Thematically, then add other styles to it. Go thematically, focus on the themes, because that's what we are interested in. And then you can add the geographic comparisons, and you can add that's the methodological perspective, you can add the chronological perspective too. Okay. But you can do thematically within thematically. What do I mean by that? Your theme is poverty. Then within that theme, look at the social definition for poverty, the economic definition for poverty, and then there is maybe cultural definition for poverty. And within the, each of them, you can even have other themes under them. So you can have themes within themes. I hope you understand me. Okay, good. Now, look at this. Social networking is increasingly becoming a phenomenon in social and business lives of employees. Statistics from the first report, you see, the first report was from America, and then the South African report was from South Africa. So compare geographic against geographic perspective. So you see that the statement was given, which was a key argument, but he compared, he compared it methodologically, one developed against developed, to be able to substantiate here. When you go to here, then again, beyond the concern on the growth of the use of social, or social network in the workplace, there have been concerns. So the concern was concern one, Access to passwords and consent to social media and strategic use in marketing and sales. So those ones are thematically. The top part is not thematically. The person, the top part is more about what methodologically comparing one geographic region to another geographic region. The second part was more thematically. So it's combining two approaches in what one writing. Do you see what I'm trying to say? And then when it gets a somehow, this is the concluding sentence at the end of the write-up. Somehow, businesses have to respond to this growing phenomenon. However, the questions are, should employers be concerned? What are the potential risks and benefits of social networking in the workplace? And how can businesses address the risk? So that's the concluding sentence for the write-up. Every literature review has an opening sentence, a body, and then what? A concluding sentence. And that's what you see here. And if you look at it in sub-paragraphs, they all have opening sentence and then some body comparisons do you realize it okay now let me ask you a question now what how do you identify a good and a, a bad literature review now this is said a bad review what is bad about it mm, what is bad about it sexual harassment has many consequences full stop adam scotty and paget found some women students said they avoided taking a class or working with certain professors because of the risk of harassment they also found that men and women students reacted differently. Benson and Thompson study in social problems, list many problems created by sexual harassment. In their excellent book, the professor Dish and Weiner give a long list of difficulties victims have suffered. So what is wrong about this? So the first statement, sexual harassment has many consequences. Um, this statement should have gotten a source, somebody, uh, um, an authority should have been cited there, but
but there is no citation there. That's the first part of it. And then I think for now that's what I've identified. I think um there is no connection between the statements the statements that he's made the person made in that um if sexual harassment has many consequences, what are the consequences? He stated some authors that have written on that and then um, they also found that men and women when and men and women students react differently so what are the reactions so i see there are no connections between the statements taking your answers or both answers um i like the second answer more than the first answer the reason being the fact that the write-up is very descriptive in this form remember we said descriptive just summarize what is there without going to on to pass judgment so as you said he mentioned some type of consequences but he didn't even give us any indication on what the consequences are it doesn't mean that there should be a reference here actually you could actually make make a statement that sexual harassment has many consequences and then make an argument as for example for instance as an illustration of this one but he didn't do that and the sub subsequent sentences that follow the consequences are just disjointed you don't see the link between those sentences and the other ones so they are just summaries of independent work splash on the screen. Do you realize that? Independent work that are splashed on the screen, which means that there's a need for there to be a link between them. We said that literature reviews about argument, evidence, illustration, and they are tied together. They're not just an argument should have a relationship with the evidence or the illustration that is put, being put across. And that's not done. But then let's look at this one. Victims of sexual harassment suffer a range of consequences from lowered self esteem and loss of self confidence to withdrawal from social interaction, change career goals, and depression. And list of references are given. For example, Adam Scotty and Paget noted that 13% of women students said they avoided taking a, pl a class or working with certain professors because of the risk of harassment. So what is good about this one? Comparatively, with I mean, com comparing this with the first one, with this one, you can clearly see that um, the writer brought um, what we've been discussing, argument, evidence, and illustrations. The author would bring in his argument, cite those who wrote that thing, and then find an illustration. That's where he brought in the examples. There's, for example, Adam, and the rest noted that 13% that those are his um, illustrations. And then the arguments are that the victims of sexual harassment suffer a range of consequences. And then he supported that with his evidence, which are the um, texts, I mean, the literature that he used. With this one, after giving the instances for, for from social interaction, changed career goals, and depression, he brings, he cites them, he gives the instances. So Adams is there, quotes K and then Pidget with the years they conducted their studies there. And then he came down to elaborate on the things he has listed up there. And that's, that makes it a very good literature review. Now, what you have said um, right is rightly um, noted. The fact that have all their consequences are outlined there are references here to support the consequences and one of the references is illustrated that's one thing you see one of the references illustrated however if this work was submitted as of this academic year maybe 2015 it will be there be something fundamentally flawed about this the reference would have been old but we are not saying it was submitted this year i hope you understand what i'm trying to say it would have been out very very outdated anyway but this is also good. The write-up is good. So we see that good literature review always has argument, evidence, and illustration. That's a very, very cool thing about literature review. Whenever you do a literature review, you are not just doing an annotated bibliography or you are not doing a summary of available materials. You are trying to make sure that you put arguments together, you put your evidence together, and then you show illustration. And that is what a good literature review should look like. So what we'll try to do next time is to look, go beyond that and ask ourselves, how do you provide the evidence? How do you do the referencing? How do you provide the evidence for the illustration? Mm. Thank you very much.